The Hunchback of Notre Dame is a heart-wrenching tale, but as dark as Disney's version is, the original story is much, much more so. Judge Claude Frollo is based on a much more twisted soul, as is pretty much every other character. They also scrubbed up Slee's bag everyone he can Phoebus a lot. There's so much death, and this story is not a happily ever after fairy tale for anyone except maybe the goat. But there are a lot of details to cover, so let's dive right in. The English version of this story is called The Hunchback of Notre Dame, which centers Quasimodo in the story, at least in title, and extensively in the Disney animation. But the original story is Notre Dame de Paris, or Our Lady of Paris, which, yes, is the name of the Grand Cathedral, but it's really also centered around La Esmeralda, and how men's passions and politics make her life and those they touch hell. It was written by Victor Hugo in 1831, but the story takes place in 1482, at a time of civil unrest surrounding the exiled Roma who sought refuge or sanctuary in Paris. Frollo is not a judge, but a young, balding, 30-ish year old archdeacon, someone who is supposed to be some moral and spiritual and religious leader. You know, from the movie, that solo voice of holy reason in the church, the only person who could speak up to judge Frollo's insanity in the eyes of Notre Dame. Well, Claude Frollo is that guy in this story. So when Esmeralda is in sanctuary in the cathedral, Frollo is also in the cathedral, circling like a thirsty shark. As is Quasimodo, some sanctuary. But that's getting a little ahead. So yes, Frollo is an archdeacon, a holy man driven to sin spectacularly. And perhaps Disney changed his job title so as not to catch any specific religious heat for this already hellfire animation. Other housekeeping, Clopin is not the narrating troubadour, but is the leader of the underground court of miracles. Pierre Gringoire is the struggling poet who relates all of the info to us. It is him who, after the festival of fools, hungry and generally sad, decides to follow Esmeralda, a pretty 16-year-old Romani dancer, and yes, her goat Jolly, to her home, which isn't creepy at all. She clocks him, glares, but he thinks, wow, her scowl was so elegant, what a muse or something, and continues stalking her, but slower so maybe she'll forget. The girl can't even have RBF in peace. But what the heck, Quasimodo and Gasp Frollo jump her and try to silence her and attack her. So I guess good thing Gringoire is being a creep. But so far, all three men are not great. Pierre calls for help, and Phoebus the Sleaziest arrives with his archers and capture the deaf Quasimodo. Phoebe the Sleaze throws Esmeralda over his horse, she thanks him, and while he is cockily preening his mustache, she escapes. During the fight, Gringoire gets knocked out and later stumbles into the Court of Miracles, where Clopin condemns him to hang. But Esmeralda saves him by agreeing to marry him in name. Zip, 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 back to the future, Quasimodo is being tortured. But newly, technically married, Esmeralda brings him some water. He's so grateful and he falls in love with her. This scene plays out similarly in Disney, but there is no big defiance like there is in there. Esmeralda gets derided by a holy lady, but still carries on dancing in front of the cathedral, where Phoebus sees her and lusts after her, as he does with most women, you'll see. Frollo, from his super-secret sorcerer scientist tower in the cathedral, also sees her and, surprisingly, Gringoire, who is helping her show. When Frollo finds out that Gringoire is actually Esmeralda's husband, boy does Frollo get weird. You haven't touched her, have you? Yikes, Frollo. And when Gringoire assures him that no, it's a marriage in name only. And were they to be intimate or Esmeralda's virginity lost, her magic amulet would no longer work to help her find her parents. Disney gave their Esmeralda an amulet to act as a map, but here it's a very different sort of map or spell. Because, you see, Esmeralda was a foundling, adopted by the outcast and raised by them. This amulet is said to help her find her parents, something she desperately wishes for. Gringoire is a patient husband, and actually loves the goat as much as he does Esmeralda. I mean, who doesn't love Jolly? But yeah, Frollo is weird about this, asking over and over again about Esmeralda's virtue. He becomes obsessed with her nun-like purity. He tries to distract himself from his lust with his books and prayers. In his tower, quote, where it is said that he lights up the kitchens of hell. Which, yes, Disney absolutely incorporated this imagery into their Hellfire scenes. When he hears that Esmeralda's goat Jolly can spell out the word Phoebus, <laughs> he actually curses all named Phoebus, a priest doing sorcery, imagine. May this nail open the tomb of anyone who bears the name of Phoebus. 
Then he throws a hammer across the tower. His little brother, Jihan, a scholar and wastrel and outcast thief himself, comes and asks for money. After Jihan leaves, Frollo follows him as he meets up with his good pal, Phoebus. The odds. Enraged, Frollo stalks them to the Eve's Apple Tavern, where Jihan spends all his new money. En route, Phoebus is bragging about bagging La Smeralda later that evening. Yes, it's Esmeralda. Phoebus cannot be bothered to learn her name. They, at some point, made plans to meet at 7 o'clock at night to <laughs> hang out. Now, Esmeralda probably doesn't know that when a love interest says, let's hang out way late at night, it's only for one thing. And that thing is probably not any sort of commitment. Because you see, Phoebus the Sleaziest is engaged. <laughs> He figures he can have it both ways, though. A pure, boring, noble wife and a lot of fiery side pieces. And he really does. He spread his love so far and wide. He spread it too wide because he, whoops, has no money to pay for the brothel room, where he is planning to take Esmeralda. So romantic. He begs Jihan for cash, but they drink most of it away. Phoebus knocks out Jihan, searches him, but still no cash. Not only does he have no loyalty to his friend, but he also doesn't even want to use his own cash to spread his love. But that's okay because Frollo, unknown to Phoebus, sneaks up and after a near duel, offers to pay for Phoebus' love motel room <laughs> on one condition. Hide me in some corner whence I can see whether this woman is really the one whose name you uttered. Phoebus is like, sure, I'll be sure to get a room with a peephole so you can watch. <sighs> he bolts the disguised Frollo in a closet while Esmeralda and her goat climb into the love room. Now, this scene is pretty awkward. It needs to be said that Book Esmeralda is a shy, inexperienced girl. She's not confident and bold like in the movie. She thinks she loves Phoebus, who is just there for a good time, worships him, her savior. When she says things like, draw your sword that I might see it, and um, kisses it, it feels innocent. Phoebus, of course, likes this. Frollo grows more angry. Phoebus, you may have guessed, is an easy lover. He is full of empty promises and recites them so well from memory that he didn't make one mistake. Except he doesn't even remember Esmeralda's name, just calls her my dear similar. And she's so in young love that she says she will change her unique name that she loves to Goten if he likes that better. <laughs> Don't change for him. He unbuckles her girdle, saying that she can't wear such street garb when she's with him. But she only hears, she is with him and swoons. He promises her a pretty house off somewhere. She asks him to teach her about his religion so that they can get married. Phoebus evades with, do people marry? And takes off her top. She freezes, clutches her amulet, and explains how important it is to finding her family. But Phoebus couldn't care less and says, You don't love me, because of her hesitation. Desperate for a future he has no intention of providing, she is willing to forgo her family, even saying she'll be his mistress, a slave, someone to organize the rest of his servants. He is such a brave man, after all. Things escalate, and Frollo, driven insane by his own lust, forsakes his calling, breaks the rotting wall he's spying behind, takes his poignard, and stabs Phoebus multiple times. I'm pretty sure that's a big sin. So much for being a holy role model. If he can't have her, no one can. Or protect her purity until he can take it. Because that's better in his sick beliefs. Remember, Frollo is obsessed with Esmeralda's virtue. And how dare the careless captain do what he wants to do. Esmeralda sees Frollo's convulsing green face above her as this is happening and passes out, but she still feels him kiss her unconscious mouth. Ugh. Frollo disappears and Esmeralda is taken into custody for murder. Now, in the Disney movie, Frollo has a soldier hit Phoebus in the back for dissension and shoots him off a bridge to drown in the river below. In the book, as we saw, Frollo has a much more impactful role with Phoebus. He curses him in his sorcerer tower and stabs him just as he's about to sheathe his sword in Esmeralda. Under torture and a joke of a trial, she confesses to the murder and being a witch, and is sentenced to the gallows. Having a cute, magical, satanic spelling goat only hurt her case. However, being the despicable, conniving vulture he is, 35-year-old Frollo visits the 16-year-old in prison and begs her to love him because it's her fault he was driven to his own basis emotional state. For the record, it's not. This is a huge monologue. He doesn't let her get a word in. My life was good until I saw you, he says, and she's like, 
Literally me too, man. He's only made her life hell. He asks for her pity, wriggles and writhes towards her like a wretched worm, begging to drink with her in the fountain of inexhaustible love. Ugh. She refuses him, and he makes her short life even more torturous for that. So she gets humiliated outside of Notre Dame pre-Gallos, where she locks eyes with Phoebus, you know, the man she is charged with murdering. That one. He's standing with his fiance, watching from her balcony. He was there to try to sneak some prenuptial loving out of her using his brave injury for sympathy. I mean, he is super injured, but doesn't want anyone else to know that he is or what he was doing when he uh, sustained such injuries, <laughs> wink wink hush hush. So he screws Esmeralda over, this time by pretending not to know her. I mean, he never could get her name right. His fiance flirtily gives him an ultimatum, her or Esmeralda, and if her, then Esmeralda must die. She's had enough of his roguish ways. But even still, how can Esmeralda be punished for the murder of someone who is still alive? I guess she did confess to being a witch, but come on. There's no intention to not hang her, and Quasimodo swings in, scoops her up, and saves the day by bringing her into the sanctuary of the church, where she forms an uneasy friendship with him. Disney's animated movie has Frollo using fancy tableware to Quasi's plane to set up the dynamic between monster versus man. I'm pretty sure that's derived directly from the book, this heartbreaking part specifically. Quasi has been taking care of Esmeralda, leaving her be as asked, providing food and safety. He can be heard talking to statues, which is a major part of the movie. He leaves her two vases, each with a flower inside of it. One is earthenware full of water and a healthy, thriving cut flower. The other is the most beautiful crystal, but it has a crack. All the water has gone and the cut flower is decaying. These are of course metaphors for Quasi's love and Phoebus's quote, love. It should be no surprise that Esmeralda chooses the crystal dead flower and wears it all day breaking Quasi's heart even more. He even offers to bring Phoebus to the church for Esmeralda, but Phoebus can't be bothered to attend every woman who says she loves him. What a rake. What if she looks like Quasi? Why would he go to her? He says this outside of his fiance's house too, having just left her. And remember, Quasi is deaf, so this is a tricky interaction. Phoebus is such a sleaze, he couldn't care less about a woman whose life is at stake for his sake. Quasi returns and simply implies that he couldn't find Phoebus, incurring Esmeralda's wrath but sparing her feelings. He does more than that. Frollo is upset because Esmeralda was basically nude in front of everybody, and he didn't get a chance to delight in her. When he learns she's claimed sanctuary in the cathedral right next door, Frollo has one hellfire of a night and decides he cannot help it anymore. He uses the secret red door to traverse from the cloister directly into the church. He slips into bed next to Esmeralda and starts to touch her, accost her in her sleep. Fortunately, Quasi has given Esmeralda a whistle in his hearing register. He rushes to her aid in the dark, but once he realizes that the pervy perpetrator is his mentor freaking Frollo, Quasi offers the priest a knife and says, you shall do all you please after, but kill me first permission to pursue the girl, but he's too cowardly to see it happen, or to prevent it faced with Frollo himself. This dog and master type of relationship is why Quasi was able to be persuaded to kidnap Esmeralda in the very start of the story. And it's deeper than that. Unlike in the movie where Frollo is forced to care for the infant as penance, in this story, Frollo adopted infant Quasimodo on Quasimodo Day, when he, Frollo, was 16. He regretted leaving his younger brother, Jihan, in order to pursue education. Frollo educated Quasi in all sorts of things, but it is absolutely a one-sided possessive power dynamic relationship. But this is part of the way Quasi's name was derived. In the Catholic Church, Quasimodo Day is the Sunday after Easter. The name is one of a few for that holy day, but the name comes from a Latin verse about pure, guileless, newborn mindset. So his name comes from the day, his shape, and his blank slate of being. Esmeralda has been gone for nearly two months, and the outcasts attack the church to rescue her. But Quasimodo, misguided, kills a lot of them, thinking their rescue party means her harm. That molten lead he uses in the movie? Yeah, he uses that on Esmeralda's rescuers, including Frollo's little brother. In the chaos of the riots in the city, Gringoire gets a boat for his wife Esmeralda and her goats, and there's also this weird cloaked figure in it too. Wonder who that could be? 
The boat is spotted and Gringoire chooses to save the freaking goat, leaving the weirdo cloaked figure to vice grip Esmeralda and drag her to La Greve. Of course, this is Frollo. This snake gives her two choices, the tomb or his bed. This is very much like it's me or the pyre. He kisses her a lot, says she's being so unfair for being unmoved by all his suffering. <laughs> what? He gets violent. She, like before, chooses death over this beast of a man and is left with that holy woman who derided her before, who turns out to be her mother. After all, Esmeralda is a pure virgin still, so her magic amulet worked. It contained her baby shoe, a twin to the one her mother carried for 15 years in frantic hope of finding her lost daughter. This happy family reunion is cut very short by, you know, death. Soldiers surround the women's cell, and Mom valiantly convinces them that she's alone. But then in passing, freaking Phoebus says like one word, and Esmeralda pops out of her hiding place and begs her love to save her. He's gone before she gets out, but the rest of the soldiers are right there. They storm the building and capture the women. As Esmeralda is led to the gallows, her mother rushes up and bites the headsman's hand, and he flings her into the pavement where she dies instantly. Esmeralda follows her into the beyond on the gallows shortly after. Quasimodo sees Esmeralda's last moments and then watches as Frollo laughs like a demon. Enraged, Quasi pushes the priest off the roof, where, like in Disney, the fall is broken by a spout. Now, Quasi could help, but he has finally thrown off the shackles Frollo had him in. Frollo's own struggle breaks the spout and he, like in Disney, falls to his own death where his body no longer resembles anything human. In both versions, Frollo's undoing ultimately is his own. Now, if you ever need a good cry, this musical number is the thing to do it. When Quasimodo finally reaches Esmeralda's discarded body, he sobs, wanting her to dance and sing once more, but vows that whoever in the future uncovers Esmeralda's grave, they will find two intertwined skeletons there. Quasimodo sits vigil with Esmeralda's body until his own gives out, which is sort of beautiful but also sort of disturbing. He was so affected by her death that he didn't want her to be alone. The two bodies are discovered ages later, intertwined. They turn to dust at being disturbed. Gringoire's artistic career finally takes off, and I'll have you know that Jolly, the goat, is okay and thriving, truly the greatest of all time. Like Disney's movie, Frollo gets his just desserts. He, for all of his righteous holiness, does not even get buried in consecrated ground though because of all the rumors that he was a sorcerer. <laughs> Isn't it ironic? Serves him right. Phoebus just gets married. Quasimodo takes his own life while well, spends what's left of it wrapped around Esmeralda's corpse, and Esmeralda is the victim of other men's unrequited passion and society at large's reluctance to embrace a different group of people. In this version, Esmeralda is a sort of canvas for a larger commentary and desires, but in the Disney version, she's a hero and agent of change herself. Also in that scrubbed up version, Esmeralda and Phoebus and Jolly end up together and everyone cheers! Quasi supports this union too. Happily ever after, Quasi is accepted into the world at large and begins his next chapter, so different from the original story. Disney uses Phoebus as a stand-in for the modern audience. Like, yes, we should agree that Frollo is losing it. How he reacts to Frollo is how the audience is thinking we would, and how the not-obsessed-with-justice person sees him. He is a neutral moral compass into Frollo's descent into Hellfire. In their movie, Phoebus gives money to beggars, well, Esmeralda, instead of taking it from a creepy priest who wants to watch some lovin' in a motel. He is generally an even character with no major foils. He is the fulcrum between Quasimodo and Judge Frollo. He is present for all characters and mostly just reacts to their plots and goes with the flow. He also has a backbone even though he's sort of a passive character. Book Phoebus is a sleaze. I mean, that's pretty much his character, or lack thereof. Disney's Frollo is what they say he is, a monster. He's brittle and unyielding, he can do no wrong, and he is the catalyst for so, so, so much suffering. In the book, he starts off as a creep. We are shown a kinder, adoptive sibling side, and a side where he kind of tries to overcome his obsession with Esmeralda through his holy books and scholarly texts. But of course, he's reduced to his basis state of emotions and desires by the end. Disney's Frollo is so blind to himself that he cannot see how dark and wrong his path is, and there's no trying to change himself or overcome anything, just giving into it and justifying it. 
Disney's Quasimodo is Frollo's exact opposite. He does have some character growth and tough choices to make, like hesitating to save his friends, in both Disney and Hugo's stories. He has dreams of living with the rest of the world in Disney, where in Hugo, he's so enraptured with Esmeralda for her kindness that he sees only her. Everything he does is for her, her comfort, her safety, her hurt feelings, and he goes with her into death, the only one whose love lasts. And while only having eyes for a person is romantic in its way, when it comes to online security, you'd better have your eyes peeled and on the lookout for dangers and strangers who mean harm, who are prowling for identities and passwords to steal. But fortunately, you can have a lot of extra eyes on your side with NordVPN, which keeps your privacy, well, private and protected. No one has time to play whack-a-mole once someone gets a hold of your data and starts wreaking havoc with it. But Nord encrypts all of your internet browsing so no one else can spy on your patterns and passwords. Because you've got better things to do, like hunt down the perfect gift for your loved ones. Which, if you're cyber shopping on the same IP as them, well, let's just say your secret gift searches won't be secret anymore when they show up in their browsers, on their phones, on Instagram, and anywhere else that shares that location. So use Nord to change your IP to a different one. And once you've fast traveled anywhere Nord is in the world, enjoy a unique show from there while you're digitally visiting. Get Nord VPN on your side by using my special link, nordvpn.com slash abitfrank, to get four extra months. Try it risk-free now with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. So that was the long and short of The Hunchback of Notre Dame book versus Disney movie. Quite a lot has changed, but some has stayed the same. The original story has a stranglehold on my heart, especially with Quasimodo's final choice, although I really did enjoy the Disney nod to Hugo's glass and earthenware vase choice to Esmeralda by using the tableware to represent Frollo and Quasimodo's relationship. But what were some of the other small details you enjoyed? This was a huge story that I had to simmer down to its essentials, so let me know in the comments below. Subscribe so you won't miss the next video, Cooking in the Cauldron, and I'll see you very, very soon in the next one. Goodbye.